Welcome, folks. Welcome to our worship for this Sunday morning. Uh, it's really good to be with you again. Um, I'm recording this on Friday. It's a bit wet and windy. I'm sincerely hoping that Sunday is a bit of a brighter day uh, than today's been anyway. It's just gone cold. It's wet. There's a a gale blown in from the the look of it and it's very very wet outside uh, look i really hope that today finds you well um it feels like autumn is really blowing in doesn't it um but i hope you're doing good um today we're beginning a, a new series uh in our sunday mornings uh for bible month um so bible month this year um really builds on what we were doing last last week uh, it builds on the book of isaiah um, so Bible Month is something that the, the Methodist Church runs or, or publishes at least um, and it invites us to, to spend a, a three, four, five weeks depending on the book um, just considering one particular book of the Bible in a bit more detail and uh, and this month, um, this year, um, Bible Month is looking at the, the book of Isaiah so in, in the past last year we looked at Ruth and, and that was really lovely and, and a lot of people really enjoyed that uh, there is something lovely about seeing a whole book in the round, um, understanding a little bit about where it's come from and who it's writing to, um, and then hearing the story uh, build upon itself week week after week, rather than, you know, sometimes with a lectionary, we just get a, a snippet here or a snippet there, and we, we dip into a book uh, without really understanding it. So um, uh, this year, as I say, we're doing um, 30 days with Isaiah, um, and it invites us just to spend a bit of time thinking about uh, who Isaiah was, um, the, the the book of Isaiah, and, and particularly the message of Isaiah as it works all the way through the uh, 60, however many chapters there are. Um, we're not going to obviously read the whole thing. Um, feel free to do that if you would like to. Uh, but we are going to dig into the, the key messages um, from Isaiah's um, prophecies. Uh, before we do that... Uh, we're going to worship and before we worship we're just going to pray and offer this time to God so let's pray together loving God we thank you for this time we thank you for this day we thank you that we are free to come before you to offer our praise and worship we pray that you would meet with us here in this place join our hearts with one another even though we're physically apart May we be joined together in the unity and the fellowship of your spirit. So speak to us this morning, we pray. Renew our hearts for the sake of your son, Jesus, our saviour. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing our first song then. And this is a song that reminds us of that, that brilliant passage we're going to hear a little bit later at the beginning of Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, uh, where in a dream he finds himself um, in the very presence of God uh, and he feels undone, utterly undone. He sees himself for who he is. This is the very lovely, uh, before the throne of God above. Let's sing together. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is Oh. 
Behold him there, the risen Lamb, by perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Saviour and my God, with Christ my Saviour and my God. Amen. Uh, it's a lovely song that I mean, it's a very old and, and traditional song um but i really really like it it's uh it just for me articulates this uh vision of isaiah who found himself before the throne of god above and um and felt utterly undone uh, utterly emptied uh by the presence of god and his own sinfulness and uncleanness um but he realized that the the one who was there uh, was a God of, of grace, of, of goodness, of mercy, um, a, a loving God who um, uh, touched his lips and, and made them clean. Uh, and for Isaiah, this wonderful, because a sinless saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. And Isaiah's response to that could be nothing other than a total commitment, a, a submission uh, to the desires, to, to the will of God and to God's purposes uh, in his own life. And I just find that utterly humbling and uh, and amazing. And, and oh, that my life should be lived with the same commitment uh, and vision as Isaiah's. Goodness me. <laughs> uh, let's pray, shall we? Uh, loving God, we thank you. Uh, thank you for Isaiah's vision before your throne. Uh, thank you for the remarkable work of your son, Jesus Christ, in the reconciliation and redemption of humankind, a, a work unachievable by our human hands and so accomplished by you, by your son, by our Redeemer. And so we offer you this time, we offer you in response our hearts, just as Isaiah uh, offered his service. Lord, renew us, restore us, redeem us, fill us again with your Holy Spirit, we pray. That we might be people of your word, people with your vision, people who share in your work, bringing hope to humankind. As we come before you in this service to look through this book of Isaiah, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to all that you're saying to us in this present day and age. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of notices. Um, the, the first is to say um, our Bible Book Club uh, online continues tomorrow. Um, so that's Monday um, the 3rd at 7.45. Um, uh, there's a, a Zoom link that I can send around if you'd like that. Do get in touch. It'll be posted on our Facebook pages. Um, and I, I love would love to see that. But we didn't have many on last month and uh, we were doing the book of Jonah. Um, and because we didn't have so many on, and that was my fault really, because I set the first one on the day before the schools all went back, so <laughs> a lot of people were rather busy, uh, which I hadn't appreciated. So look, we're going to do uh, the book of Jonah uh, in our Bible book club tomorrow, and, and I would love to see you uh, on that call. Um, do just let me know if you haven't got a link and you would like one. We're going to sing uh, again. We're going to sing um, a lovely uh, song that, that gives uh, an image of this vision of Isaiah again from Isaiah 9. Uh, this is uh, Christ as the light of the world. Uh, the people in walking, who've been walking in darkness 
you'll remember have seen a great light. Um, this is Light of the World. Let's worship together. That's another lovely song, isn't it? And, uh, and one that again reflects the vision of Isaiah, that the, the light would come amidst the darkness of, of exile and difficulty for the people of God. We're going to turn to prayer now. We're going to remember in prayer those we love, those who are close to us. Um, we're going to remember too the, the family of Margaret Cullingworth, who really sadly died this week, Michael and Margaret um, were a big part of our church in Settle um, and sadly Margaret passed away. Her funeral will be this Thursday um, at two o'clock at St John's uh, and anybody would be very welcome to come to that. Um, but of course we'll remember the family in our prayers. Let's pray. Loving God, we lift up before you those we know and love who are going through hard times at the moment. We remember all who mourn, particularly the family of Margaret Cullingworth who died this week. We remember Michael and all of the family. Oh, gracious God, surround them with your love, we pray. May they know your peace, but may their grief be punctuated by hope. We pray for all who mourn, those who've lost loved ones in recent times or many years ago, but still mourn their loss. Lord, comfort them, we pray. 
for all who are sick, for those we know and love who suffer in body, mind or spirit. God, we pray that we lift them to you. We ask for your healing spirit to be poured upon them in full measure, pressed down and running over. May they know the very fullness of life with you. We pray for friends and neighbours. We pray for our community. We pray for all who worry in these current times about how they'll make ends meet, how they'll meet their bills. We pray for all who are lonely, all who are lost, all who need your comfort in these difficult times. God, draw near to your people. Hear our cry, we pray. We pray for our leaders, for our government. We pray for all in authority, that that authority might be used justly and wisely. May we love mercy. May we seek equality. May we love and pursue justice with our whole hearts. And so we pray for our world. We pray for a world at war. We pray for a world suffering from climate breakdown. We remember all in Ukraine and we remember communities in Florida devastated by the hurricane. God, draw near, we pray. Reach out to this world in your mercy and your love. Comfort, heal and restore. May the whole of creation know your redeeming spirit. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing again, and again, uh, a song that reflects an, an aspect of Isaiah's prophecy. This was looking forward to, to Jesus, the the suffering servant, if you like. This is Man of Sorrows, Man of Sorrows. Let's worship together. Hallelujah, God be praised, he 
Amen. Uh, a lovely uh, hymn uh, and one that rejoices that through that man of sorrows, through that rugged cross, uh, salvation was found, love was poured out and now our soul cries in response, just as Isaiah's cried in response. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, we're going to hear our scripture reading now. We're going to um, hear, um, first of all this morning, uh, from Isaiah chapter 6. So this is the commissioning of Isaiah. Um, and I think it's good as we go into Bible month to think about um, the, the, the beginning of this for Isaiah. Because this passage uh, roots this uh, prophet in a particular time and place. Um, and remarkably, his voice still speaks to us through the ages even now. Um, but this was the commissioning of Isaiah. So Isaiah chapter 6, uh, starting at the first verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes, for otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, for how long, Lord? He answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leaf stumps, when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Uh, this story of Isaiah, this vision of Isaiah, is a remarkable vision. Uh, a vision of heaven and heavenly creatures far beyond our understanding in this world. Uh, Isaiah in the presence of God was completely undone. He saw his humanity for what it was. He saw the glory of God, the holiness of God, the pureness of God for what it was and himself standing by contrast. Isaiah was made clean, was made whole by God. God had a commission for him, a, a response that Isaiah couldn't refuse. 
We'll come on to that reading uh, in a moment or two. Uh, before we do that, we're going to sing uh, one more time. Uh, we are going to sing... Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, living for your glory, living for your glory, which is really what Isaiah decided to, to do in response to the grace of God. This is living for your glory. Let's sing together. What good is it to gain the whole world but lose your soul? What good is it to make a sweet sound but remain? Mercy, I offer my all. Take my life, let it be everything, all of me. Here I am, use me for your glory. In everything I say. It finds meaning in surrender, in view of God's mercy. I offer my all. Take my life, let it be everything. Shall we uh, pray before we go into this book, into this word then? Let's just pray. Uh, loving God, we thank you for this vision of Isaiah, uh, of a place before your throne where rather than stand accused, he finds himself made clean and called to your purposes and your service for his life. We pray that you would speak to us of your call on our lives, of your purposes for us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I wanted to begin Bible Month just by talking a little bit about um, uh, who Isaiah was and this vision of Isaiah. Um, it's an intriguing book. Um, it covers quite a long period in Israel's history. Um, and at the time of writing, it's actually placed pretty uh, decently for us uh, in this passage, which tells us of King Uzziah. Um, so at the time of writing, and it's around 750, uh, 740, 750 BC, um, and Israel and Judah are small and quite separate nations, um, the result of a, a split in the kingdom of Israel um, under Saul in uh, around the 10th century. Um, Israel lies to the north, Judah with Jerusalem as its capital to the south. And it's Judah which has the history primarily that we read in the Bible, the, the famous kings, um, David and Solomon, who sat upon the throne. 
though by the time we reach Isaiah, uh, those momentous and well, relatively prosperous times, the people have, have long gone. The beginning of Isaiah then speaks of, of this time when King Uzziah is on the throne. Uh, in, in fact, it begins uh, in Isaiah 6, as we've just heard, in the year that King Uzziah died. Um, and that's recorded as 740 BC. Uzziah had ruled probably for 50 years or so, more than half a century. Um, and the nation of Judah uh, had been pretty stable and, and actually reasonably prosperous under that stability. We we know what that's like, don't we? Uh, you know, we've had our own queen on the throne for that period of time. Uh, and having a ruler... Um, for that long gives a, a nation stability and, and allows them to build prosperity. But unfortunately, in, in the last four or five years for Israel and for Judah, there have been quite a lot of changes in the, the neighbouring nations. And those changes now threaten the peace of both Israel and Judah. Uh, in particular, there's a change of king in Assyria. So Assyria is the, the neighbour to the north um, and the new king is uh, aggressive, uh, ambitious uh, and there's a lot of instability now on the uh, country's borders. There's a lot of uncertainty uh, about what, what's going to happen. And, and it's this uncertainty, it's this picture of instability, the threat from Assyria into which Isaiah speaks. So uh, as we read the, these prophecies and, and passages in Isaiah, we've to bear in mind, firstly, the time that he was speaking to. And, and he was speaking to a people who felt uncertainty, who felt, who felt instability, who, who knew of this, this threat of invasion um, and oppression and exile that hung over them. Uh, within a couple of years of Isaiah's first words, um, Israel is exiled. The, the Assyrians come, uh, they take over the land of Israel. The Israelites are forced into exile in Assyria. And Assyria stands within eight miles of Jerusalem. That's a big deal. You'll remember, as we've talked before about the Psalms and, and all the things um, that have gone on, Jerusalem is a place of God's presence. Jerusalem is the heart of the Jewish people, of God's people. This is where, symbolically, God dwells among them. Uh, it, it isn't just about place, it's about identity. It tells them who they are, uh, that, it, that Jerusalem stands at the heart of the place. And, and at the very heart of Jerusalem, of course, the temple built by Solomon under the instructions of God to be the dwelling place of God. Uh, and as it was commissioned, um, you know, the glory of God fell upon it such that people couldn't go into it or, or look upon it. So for Assyria, the, the aggressive uh, Assyrian regime to be just eight miles from this uh, dwelling place of God uh, gave a huge uncertainty. As we work through Isaiah, uh, we'll see that some of that uncertainty really played out. Um, it didn't go particularly well for the people of God. But the question that people had at the time, the question that we might ask looking back, is if these were the people of God, then, then where was God in all of this? What was going on? Uh, and perhaps that's a, a perfectly valid question. And we might look around at our own world and ask, well, where is God today? Where is God in the here and now? And where was God in those days is the question that gets answered really by this uh, book of Isaiah. Uh, in the lead up to what became the ultimate exile of the Judean people in Babylon, Isaiah speaks words of rebuke, words of warning, uh, words of prophecy of that desperate time. And we heard some of those at the end of um, that commissioning passage in Isaiah 6, um, God speaks to Isaiah of a, a desert land, of a, an emptiness, of a ravaging of the land that, that leaves no stone unturned. And all that's left in the land is a, a small but holy remnant. 
And, and so to the dispirited, to the broken people after exile, Isaiah comes back with words of comfort, uh, words of hope, uh, words that assure the people that even in their exile, even in that time of what feels like utter emptiness, God is with them, God is among them. And Isaiah's remarkable words point not just to a hope for the exiled people and a restoration of the physical places of Jerusalem, but of a greater hope still, an ultimate restoration, a a greater redemption according to the plans of God. So in this first part of the book, Isaiah's warning the people against military confrontation, uh, a Syrian mass on the borders, um, the, the king of, the, of Judah wants to make a peace, wants to create a political alliance. It seems opportune uh, to him to, to get into bed with the, the king of Assyria, um, to throw his lot in with them. But Isaiah is in the the tradition of David. Uh, He's in the tradition of the the prophets of the the, the kings uh, of Elisha and Elijah. And he reminds the people that there is this this eternal covenant that the people have uh, between themselves and God. He tries to tell them that it's God that will uphold them. A God that will strengthen the city of Jerusalem uh, and the people of Israel and Judah, if only they will return to him. He casts judgment on, on where they are now, on the practices uh, that they seem to have adopted, of the, the self-aggrandizement uh, and the building up of uh, previous empires and wealth under Solomon. And he consistently urges reliance on God as opposed to these opportunistic military alliances, he wants them to do the right thing. He wants them to to turn back to God, to, in the words of Micah, love mercy, seek justice, walk humbly with God, not looking to be a a great empire, not looking to be a majestic fighting force, but but simply to be who they are uh, truly before God. I wonder if we might take a moment to just reflect on how hard it must be to be called to be a prophet. Uh, In the Bible Book Club, we've been reflecting on the story of Jonah, uh, the book of Jonah, and and goodness me, how hard it must have been for Jonah to be called to go to the the mortal enemies, to to the Ninevites, uh, to tell them to repent and, and to watch as they do it. These are the people that have the sworn enemies of Israel, the people that don't recognise Israel as as a nation. And Jonah is called to go to them uh, and tell them to turn back to God and and to seek his forgiveness. And his greatest fear is that they do. He dearly, dearly wants God to just crush them. Prophets are rarely very popular. They're often sent uh, by God to give people a a bit of a wake-up call, perhaps a bit of tough love. But for Isaiah, after that remarkable encounter with God, well, it was a call that he couldn't ignore. He'd been transported in a dream to the throne room of heaven. He'd been confronted with his own sinfulness and the disobedience of the people. He was, by God's grace released from his uncleanness and his response when confronted with that great divine question who will go for us feels like a, an, an involuntary but inevitable reflex here I am he said send me and so God does send him he, he sends him to a disobedient people with a, a message of tough love But he sent him to prophesy too, into a time of exile, to a kingdom that had lost its ruler. And he sent him to speak of a king that was still to come. To a kingdom without a head, 
He spoke of a king who would bring hope. He spoke of restoration, of redemption of a a servant king. One not in it for his own gain, but one who sought the best, the goodwill for all. We've sung about that king a few times in our service today. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. A sinless saviour, a king who died for each one of us. Whether Isaiah knew of this hope in years to come, we'll never know. His prophetic teachings speak into a people in exile. They're words of comfort, words of uh, hope, words that speak of restoration and redemption. And a restoration and redemption that was ultimately seen throughout the book of Isaiah. But it speaks to us too. I think it's not enough to take the end hope of Isaiah and claim that without also hearing these early words of tough love. Are we the people that God speaks to about our own reliance, our own um, insistence on taking the easy path, on not confronting those who do evil, of not turning fully to God's plans and purposes and submitting to them? Do we think our own plans are more successful than God's plans. Isaiah has some hard messages, some tough love to give out. But ultimately it's a message of hope. And we're grateful to Isaiah for bringing it to us. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing again. We're going to sing our final hymn. Uh, as we come before God, guide me then, guide me in, in all things, O thou great Jehovah. Let's sing. And may that uh, final hymn be our prayer as we go through this coming week. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, as I pilgrim through this barren land, for I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. If ever there was a synopsis of the early prophecies of Isaiah, then 
this is it. May we not get into bed with foreign kings. May we not seek to align ourselves with foreign powers. May we turn to and rely on our great Redeemer. For we are weak, but he is mighty. Hold us then, God, with your powerful hand, we pray. Thank you for joining me for this service this week. It's been lovely to talk. Next week we'll pick up and continue our journey through uh, Isaiah as Isaiah prophesies to the people uh, and they decide to listen to him or not. (laughs) Until then, uh, have a wonderful week and may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon each one of us this day and forevermore. Amen. Uh, Amen. Thank you for joining me. Do have a, a wonderful week. God bless. by the